Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Masters University webinar. My name is Vanessa Haynes. I am the admissions event manager here at TMU. Uh, in just a few moments, I'll get to our guests and our topic, but just a few logistical items before we begin. Please note that your camera and your microphone are turned off at this time. Um, know that we are recording the session. We'll make that available to you as soon as possible. We would love to hear from you, so please go ahead and include uh, your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom middle of your screen. Um, and then last, we, ju we just thank you for your patience as we make the best use of technology. Uh, if you do get logged out, go ahead and use that original link in your email uh, to log back in. Well, allow me to introduce our guests. Uh, we have with us Dr. Paul Plew and Sarah Dixon, um, beloved professors. Dr. Paul Plew is Dean of the School of Music and Director of Chorale Activities. He has taken choirs and ensembles to nearly every state in the Union and several foreign countries. The Masters Chorale has sung several times at Carnegie Hall and has recorded for several music publishing companies and guest artists, including most recently Matt Redman. Last summer, the Chorale um, was the guest choir for the Sing Conference for Keith and Christine Getty. Dr. Plew came to Masters in 1979 and has remained a beloved and well-known professor ever since. Sarah Dixon is a director of vocal studies in the School of Music. She teaches private voice lessons, class voice, as well as diction and pedagogy courses in voice. She also oversees student recitals and the opera production. This is her 14th year at the institution and she's also an alum and also met her husband while singing in the master's chorale. How special, they have two boys. Well, welcome to both of you. And I think I see Mitch Hopewell also joined us. Uh, Mitch is gonna be conducting the Q&A. Mitch Hopewell is our um, Interim Provost and Dean of Online Learning. Dr. Hopewell oversees the academics at TMU as well as our online programming. So welcome to all three of you. We're very <laughs> excited to have you with us and look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say about the School of Music. Uh, I think we're just gonna yep. wait for Mitch to join. Alrighty. Hi. Hi, Vanessa, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Welcome, Dr. Plu and Sarah. I'm pleased to have you. Uh, we've done a few of these uh, interviews over the last couple of weeks and uh, just really looking forward to this one. So um, I know Vanessa introduced you, but I wonder, uh, Dr. Plu, if you might start by just telling us about how long you've been at the university again and then how you came to be here and some of your background. I, I came here in, thank you, Dr. Hopewell. I came here in 1979, which is quite a while ago. And uh, the Lord has been good to us, and I have been able to do my passion, which is music. And I know many of you out there listening, that is something that you want to do. And following your dream or your passion for what God has for you, your life will be just um, something that is a wonderful, wonderful journey. And grew up in a musical family. I'm the youngest of six children, so believe it or not, we would do a radio program every week as a family. And so sometimes I ask myself, I say, is it, the decisions I make musically, is it something that um, uh, I know because of degrees and experience and education and so forth, or is it everything that I learned before I was 10 years old, when I just absorbed what was happening musically all around me and all my family. And I'm just thrilled to be able to um, I commit my life to investing in the lives of young men and women through music. What a wonderful thing. Hey, folks, um, we know we're going to be making something way better than music in heaven. But if you want to taste a little bit of heaven, um, music is something that will carry you through the portals of heaven. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sarah, uh, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and um, your connection to the university and how you got to be here. Sarah, thank you so much. I attended master's as a student in uh, 2001 and majored in music. I remember coming to visit uh, back then it was the master's college and came to a Christmas concert and I heard some of the groups performing. I met Dr. Plu and the other faculty and I, um, I just really sensed at master's that there was a genuineness in the faculty and in the students that they were there um, more than just at an institution with a Christian name, but that they were really there to grow in their walks with the Lord. That stuck out to me as I was looking at colleges and um, 
So I decided to come to master's and studied vocal performance and music ed, went on to get my master's degree. And in that time, I was actually working in the music office um, to help put me through school after college. And uh, Dr. Plew was my boss. <laughs> and um, I filled in for the uh, voice instructor at that time when she went on sabbatical and discovered how much I loved teaching voice. Um, so it was through that opportunity and as I was in school pursuing singing um, and doing performance and all of that, that I really, really found a love for teaching. And so I have been teaching on an adjunct and then now full-time level, uh, as Vanessa said, for 14 years. And I love, um, I love being able to teach music and use it as a tool to invest in students' lives. The students that come to master's, as I referred to, um, are here because they want to grow in their walks with the Lord, whatever it is that they study. So I love that I get to teach voice and other music related courses, but more than that, I get to pray with my students and pour into their lives and hopefully encourage them in their walks. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, let's, uh, as we've done with some of our other interviews, let's talk about uh, maybe the current state of uh, your discipline area and, and, and what Dr. Plu, maybe you could, you and I had chatted about this uh, yesterday. What, what are we seeing about what's going on with the music industry in general, uh, you know, in terms of the, we we're kind of under this pandemic situation and life has been disrupted. What are musicians doing? What are some of the folks that you're connected to? Uh, how are they reacting to this? Well, first off, it's very difficult to um, have a choir rehearsal or to have an orchestra rehearsal or any kind of rehearsal online. And um, so what many choirs are doing, they're just getting together online and listening to music. And like, for example, last, this past week, we had a special guest in Dan Forrest coming online, a, a well-known composer talking about his music, answering questions with the students. And um, we listen to great music. You can listen to music and by the way, the chorale just recorded in February, so we're listening to some of the things that they have just done. But in talking to musicians in churches, of course, they're, everything has to be done in a small group with the distancing of six to eight feet. And so you learn how to do things differently. You cannot have major concerts. We've had to cancel all of our major concerts, all of our um, uh, recitals all have to be taped and just sent in, recorded, and you can have no audiences. And um, um, so that, you know, we find out how important an audience is in music. And there are certain things that you do because um, an audience will tell you what to do. Now, you know, unless you're a musician, the vibes of that is very hard to, what do you mean an audience talks to me? Well, they do. And, um, and an audience can be very, very encouraging, but that's not there. So you just deal with recognizing, I think, maybe uh, what the audience should be is God and God alone. And in church, mm -hmm. that's, that's what we do in uh, meeting together. And uh, many churches are recording it during the week. And then putting it on line on a given Sunday. Many other churches, mine included, do it live at the same time. And um, so, but the idea of concert tours, uh, our tour, we had to cancel our tour. And, um, uh, and, and so our students, the, the, the seniors especially, that's very challenging for them, but they understand this is something that has been brought our way and we accept it as from the hand of God. And so what I did, we put together a video of all of the things that we have done all year. And the students look at that and say, wow, we did have a lot of opportunity. And so anything that could be encouraging uh, to our musicians, um, I would say those listening who would be in that um, area where you are in a leadership musically, um, hey, encourage them somehow, get them talking. And uh, we talk, we give testimonies. I bring alums in um, who've been in the chorale, um, giving testimonies of what the chorale meant to them, their favorite songs. I had a young man yesterday, uh, Michael Jackson, not the Michael Jackson you may be thinking about, 
but uh, Michael Jackson gave his testimony and his wife and his three children have all been in the corral and his daughter Becca Jackson is in the corral right now. So what a great time to kind of step back and really see what God has done and look forward to what the future will hold once this is all behind us. Yeah. Sarah, have you, uh, in terms of voice and recording or instruction, how has that, as the technology, how has technology changed uh, or enabled that? Well, I think um, we're all very thankful for the technology that we have, even compared to 10 years ago, if this had happened. Um, and as you alluded to, the industry has definitely um, taken a hit and changed um, as far as entertainment in general, but musicians in particular with concerts being canceled at the at a large scale. Um, but it's been really fun to see how um, how people have been creative with their solutions. Um, I've had some some colleagues who are, um, you know, doing collaborative recitals online and the pianist is at their home and the singer is at their home and they're making it happen. And uh, conductors are, are putting virtual choirs or virtual orchestras together. And you, we've all seen some of that come through social media. So I think it's just a neat opportunity for musicians to think of new ways to share their art. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as how we've been working that at Masters with teaching, we've just been using platforms like this one um, to have lessons and still be able to have some face-to-face -face live time for all of our singers. Um, they've been singing with recordings from their pianists and um, either, either I've been listening to them live and giving feedback like in a regular lesson or I've had them even um, submit audio or video recordings of themselves because that gives me a little bit of a clearer picture with some of the nuances needed. Mm -hmm. um, that's how we, that's how we're going to do our juries, which is like the final for voice lessons or piano lessons. Um, next week during finals week, all the students will still have juries, but they'll be submitting those, uh, via video and we'll give feedback that way. And that's how our recital students are, um, fulfilling their recitals. So we're trying to make it happen for them and still, um, yeah. simulate the experience as much as we can, and then provide some opportunities once our campus opens again for those students to come back and maybe, um, do recordings in our hall or have a senior showcase even in the next year so that those students can still have the audience element that Dr. Plew was talking about because it's not yeah. you, you can't replace that. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Dr. Plew, um, Sarah mentioned something about our the re rec doing some recordings. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about some of the facilities at, at Masters and uh, what we've done with those? Well, uh, we do have 16,500 square feet of music making in our music building. And uh, we have a studio, which is, um, um, I don't wanna use state of the art studio, but really it is. I mean, everything is there. And the, the hall itself becomes the stage. And so we can record small groups, individuals, large groups, and um, many of our concerts are also live streamed. And so, and that is the beauty of it. You get parents or prospective students who are spread all over the country or all over the world, and uh, they can go online and, and hear the concert. So we have a special program in our audio technology whereby all of the students that graduate from there, they pretty much immediately fall right into positions and great positions in, in the industry or a lot of churches have a lot of um, media and uh, sound technicians that are in churches. There's a church in Texas that has three of our graduates from this degree and they're all working together and, and serving the Lord in Basically, technology is what really brought them together in church ministry. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Blue, I want to come back to, uh, definitely to some of the employment positions and placements that our students um, uh, have participated in. Uh, but Sarah, I'd like to ask you a question. One of the questions that came in from uh, one of the pan one of the viewers um, is um, a student is just asking, you know, if I want to leverage or use my a music my music degree uh, in a way to serve others and and uh, of course serve in the local church and serve her family. Um, this uh, young lady is asking about specifically some other ways that people are using their music degree to serve uh, their communities and those, that kind of thing. Um, 
well, yes, if I understand the question right, um, you, we can always be using our musical gifts in church, like um, Dr. Hopewell alluded to, but other ways that, that the music degree can be utilized would be um, performing, performing either at the professional level or the community level, um, whether that would be community theater, community orchestras and choirs. Um, some of those positions are paid, some of them are volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of uh, teachers, a lot of people graduate with the music degrees and teach, whether that would be privately in their homes um, or it, through a studio or um, at, a, at an institution, high school level, you know, in grammar school, at the college level. And then we have several who have gone out. Um, they are music pastors, worship leaders. A lot of our guys have done that. Um, and then the tech realm that Dr. Palu just mentioned. Um, we have several who perform in the area, whether that would be in jazz ensembles or, um, you know, we're in LA. So there, there are a lot of audition opportunities, again, for things like musical theater. We've had some, some people go on to sing in opera companies or professional choirs to do tours with Disney cruises. And um, I think there are all sorts of ways that, that the degree can be used as far as jobs. Um, you know, but in serving, again, that, that's in church, that's with your kids when you sing to them at night, um, mm -hmm. when you're putting them to bed, that might be to get a group together and go sing at a nursing home. I think there just are all sorts of ways that music can touch people's hearts and having studied that in college will only prepare you better for that. I hope I answered that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, Dr. Plew, uh, we have a question about um, composition majors and careers, uh, so I want to come back to you and uh, maybe share uh, some of the ways in which students have been able to engage uh, in an industry that um, is um, uh, it's unique, it's diverse. Uh, what have some of our students done? Sarah, you just mentioned a few which are really interesting and even one I hadn't heard, the, the Disney Cruise uh, Choir, so that's, uh, that's great. Um, Dr. Palu, but what, what, what about um, maybe particularly in the area of composition uh, and, and then some highlights of alumni? Well, composition. Um, I always tell students, the more you can do in music, the better. We have composition majors who um, they, they graduate, but they also are proficient in an instrument or they're a conductor. Now, I think of uh, Ben Mason, who uh, heads up our composition department, but he writes a lot for the industry. And uh, Gary Kuo, who, again, writes a lot for the industry, but, but Gary came out of Juilliard and uh, with, as a violin performance major and just loved writing and went to the University of Miami and uh, finished a two-year degree there in writing and basically he has a full-time job in the industry downtown, uh, writing at, um, for various programming and so forth. And there's all kinds of opportunities, but there's time there might be not the opportunities that come in. And so that's where your teaching or your performing happens. But um, yeah, composition, um, if you're gonna go into that, you have to have it right here. You mm -hmm. have to have, the, and, and you have to have a time that you can you can write every day. Now, I was talking to Dan Forrest last week and I asked him the question. I said, do you have a specific time every day that you write? And his comment was, no, I just, I just write every day, but it's not always the same time, but he, you have to be inspired. And mm -hmm. so composition is something, it's like, a, it's, a, it's a writer. You have to have something to say and many times, um, there are schools or churches or organizations that will commission you to write something. And, um, and that, is, that is very exciting. And we have composers who've graduated from here. Basically, much of, their, um, much of their financing is through commissions. But they're also a music pastor or also they, they teach someplace uh, on a part-time basis. So you just put all of that together. But I'm telling you, there's nothing like a God sent composer. I mean, and if you're going to write for the church, folks, let me say this. Make sure you understand you're writing to lift up the God of all gods. Okay. That's very, very important. And do your best. Do your best. 
spend time at it. And uh, we commissioned Dan Forrest to write a song, uh, which is And Can It Be, a hymn arrangement. And he went through a hundred melodies. Tell mm. me, that, that takes time. You can't say, okay, after today, it's over. No, he went through a few months. And um, now it's not like I, uh, you know, sometimes we think of someone like George Frederick Handel, who wrote the entire Messiah in 24 days. Well, um, sometimes you can do it very, very quickly. Other times it is hard work. Hmm. Yeah. Well, he definitely had a handle on the situation, didn't he? Nice. Uh, <laughs> I just had to throw that one in there. Um, Dr. Plew, you did mention something about comp uh, composing for the church, and we have a special connection to uh, a couple who do a lot of uh, composition of modern hymns for the church. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that relationship that we have with the Gettys and, and what uh, some exciting um, developments we have there? Yeah, well, Keith and Kristen Getty have, um, they started, they're from Ireland, Actually, we had a young man doing an internship in Ireland. His name is John Martin. And um, he met this young college student. And uh, this young college student put a cassette tape into the car cassette player and said, John, what do you think about this song? Well, it's the first time they'd ever heard In Christ Alone. And um, well, that was Keith Getty. And um, there has been a relationship to our school ever since then. And uh, Keith moved here to um, uh, the United States and lives in Nashville now. And um, last summer, he invited the Master's Chorale to come and be the main choir in, um, at the SING conference. We have several of our faculty that have done uh, workshops there. And um, actually, anytime Keith is in town, he comes and does lectures and workshops. Actually, Keith Getty is on the music advisory board. And so just a, a dear, dear friend, but I'm telling you, one of the foremost writers for the church today. Mm. And uh, we're just glad that they are very excited to join with us here at Masters. And uh, to be a part of what we're doing and encourage our students. And so they're on, I think, Tuesday nights with their family. And that's how important this is. They want to encourage our, our culture, our people. And so they're on Tuesday nights with the family, just, yeah. just, just singing. Yeah. So there's just a great relationship. And um, uh, he also helps there's times when he's here, he will go through manuscripts of our composers and tell them what they could do better and what they're doing well. And so it's, it's a great, it's a great marriage. Absolutely. And, and it, and it doesn't end there. We've had special guests, even this last year, uh, that came to campus and did a special recording, uh, with the choir. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, and again, if I could tell you so much is networking, when um, we, uh, we sang, the Gettys do a, a Christmas program all around the country, and they were at Sagastrum Auditorium in Costa Mesa, and they invited the chorale to come and sing there. I was there. And, and with them, I think you were there. I was. Well, and uh, through that, Matt Redman came up to me afterwards, and we started a conversation. And um, so as a result of that, um, last fall, he did a recording and he said, uh, uh, is there any way that the Master's Chorale can be a part of this recording? So um, uh, we did that and he was also in chapel just, uh, well, a couple of months ago now. Yeah, it but seems he, like a long but, time, but. Yes, it does. But he's very interested and he lives again, an hour and a half away. Yeah. And uh, very interested in joining with <clears> us. <throat> and folks, all I'm telling you, these are names that are known throughout um, the country. And we're just glad that they want a partnership with uh, all of our music staff. And we have a great music staff, folks. And just to tell you, we have, we have um, probably something like 30 on our music staff and, and half of them teach private instruction. But I'm telling you, they love music. They're well-trained in music. But I'm telling you this, 
they will love you more than their music and they love God more than anything else. And um, it's a wonderful thing to be together in this, um, in this opportunity. Sarah, why don't you tell me a little bit about um, some of the students that are coming into the program? Uh, we had a couple of questions uh, come up from the uh, attendees about, you know, I'm interested in studying music. Uh, what is what's required in terms of proficiency in a in a in either composition or an instrument or vocal? Sure. Sure. Um, we do have entrance auditions um, for for music majors. The exception to that is the um, music production degree or the um, audio tech and communication degree that we offer. So those students typically um, just do an interview with some of our faculty so that they can ask questions and get to know them in advance. But other students, performance majors or music education majors, composition majors, um, worship majors, uh, we have you do um, an audition, which typically is live, but because of how things have changed in the last month, we are taking all of our auditions um, through video submissions. And uh, on our website, you can see some specifics about um, what's required for the various areas, You know, whether you wanna have voice be your main instrument or piano or bassoon, whatever it may be. So we have some guidelines there. So when students, um, typically in a live audition, they will play or sing for us, and then we will assess musicianship a little bit of sight reading, um, rhythmic uh, reading like that, a little bit of um, seeing piano background, testing the ear. It just takes about five minutes, but that's something this year that we will wait to assess until the fall when our students are here. So mm -hmm. everything right now for students who are coming in and who we're talking with about uh, you know, starting in the fall, we've, we've gotten audition materials from them and we're still happy to take more for students who are interested. Sure. Uh, I'm just curious myself, prompted by one of the questions, um, if somebody who was interested in music but just wanted to just kind of get up to speed in terms of reading music and getting, are there any free re free resources you can think of or uh, ways to kind of get um, to get up to speed on that? You want me to take that? Sure. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I think if you just Google online sightsinging.com, you know, I mm -hmm. think you could find something. Um, if you've never taken piano lessons, this might be a great time to find a virtual teacher, you know, find somebody who can do some Zoom lessons or something just to give you the basics of theory. Understanding the piano keyboard is such a um, great basis for any, any music degree. Um, and then definitely there are sight singing resources, a book, there's a book called Melodia. It's a, just a book that's been used for years. If you can sing a line of that every day and test yourself and see if you can tell if the notes move up or down, how long the duration is and all of that, and just start trying, just practice it. That's yeah. how you get better at sight reading is just to try it, sing in a choir, pull out yeah. some sheet music, see if you can make sense of it. Couple questions came in um, that I that I wanted to kind of relate to my own experience, and and for those that are that are watching, I, as a student back at the Master's College um, back in the '90s, I was not a music major, but I was involved uh, to some degree, and um, and Dr. Plu was a was a, a fantastic encouragement and a partner in that. Um, let's uh, two part question. Um, uh, for those, who, well, not really a two-part question. The question is really related to what are some of the opportunities that students who are not music majors might have uh, to be a part of, of what's going on at the university? Uh, and then um, I will just add this because it's related to students who are not majors, but even what those who are, uh, that, that the, 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 I'll just say this so you guys don't have to toot your own horn. I'll say this that the, the, the faculty and uh, Dr. Plu and, and those on the, in, on the faculty and staff at the, in the music department, incredibly encouraging. Uh, you heard Dr. Plu mention earlier about the interest in your personal life, uh, not only on the part of our uh, adjunct faculty, but uh, on our, on our full-time faculty as well. And that will be a theme that you'll see throughout the institution. Um, well, our humanities professors care about the humanities and political studies and um, English and literature, they care more about you as a student. They care, we care more about our students uh, than we, you might find uh, at many other institutions. And while we do have faculty that are um, just remarkable in their field, 
uh, they are not remarkable in their fields to the exclusion of caring about our students. And so um, maybe just uh, Sarah or Dr. Plu, maybe just talk a bit about uh, opportunities that non-majors might have uh, with the music department. Well, Go ahead. yeah, I am. Um, there are many opportunities. There is the chorale is an audition group, the master's chorale, but I would say half of the students in that group are not music majors. Um, in our instrumental ensembles, I mean, where would we be if they were just all music majors? And so if you're not a music major and you play an instrument and you've played in your school and your high school and your church, definitely we want you to be a part. And I would say the chapel band, which happens for chapel, um, I would say half of them are not music majors. They're wonderful, wonderful opportunities. And uh, we also have a um, what I call the University Singers, which is a non-audition group. And that group has ranged anywhere from 90 to 110, 120 or 30. I have some community, community people in that, but we do major works. Now this fall, we're doing uh, Antonio Vivaldi's The Gloria. I, I, when are you going to have an opportunity to sing major works like that? This last year, we did the entire um, um, Messiah. Now, obviously, we didn't finish it because we didn't do the concert, but the students had the opportunity to sing it and to experience that kind of thing. And so, but again, that's a, that's a, I, I have students that are in that, that have, that in some cases did not even match a pitch. And we work together with them. And I, I'm telling you, it, it, is, it is a heart thing with me when I, they start matching pitches, they start singing and, and, and they're teary-eyed, they're hearing it. And frankly, I think, I think everybody at Masters ought to take voice class. I, I mean, you, you sing, we sing <laughs> in our churches. And, and to know something about that language. And, and again, knowing some, am I getting a little excited here? <laughs> <laughs> knowing this language of music. Look, I always say, if you're gonna live in Germany, you gotta know German. If you're gonna live in Italy, you gotta know Italian. If you wanna live in the world of music, yeah, you're creative. Yes, you hear melodies, but know something about, about the language, okay? And, it's, and you don't have to be a music major to be a part of the School of Music. And Sarah, go ahead and say a little bit about opera and those kinds of things. Sure. Yeah, we also have an opera production every year that we have uh, non-music majors can audition for that uh, theater program. We do musicals every so often. Um, we have, as Dr. Blue mentioned in our instrumental group, we have an orchestra, we have wind ensemble, um, a string group, um, as well as a jazz band, which this next year we're adding, uh, hoping to add vocalists to. Um, so that jazz band is sometimes more of a small intimate combo, other times big band. Um, and then as Dr. Plu mentioned, non-music majors are welcome to take our classes. So we have some classes for beginners such as class voice, um, class guitar, uh, and we also have a lot, a lot of non-music majors take individual instruction in, in virtually any instrument that they desire. So yeah, there's, there's a class like a music fundamentals class, which is just basics of reading music, okay? Something that encourage a non-music major to take. Mm -hmm. What does it look like to double major at masters with one of those being music? Um, we have had students do it and they have to be motivated and really wanna do so. But we've had several students over the years, you know, I had friends I went to school with and I've advised students over the years who studied music with a science, music with English. We've had students who are also um, on an athletic team at the university and they make it happen. The advisors have to just team up and work together to make sure that all, all this can be done in four years, but it is possible. Um, things like dual enrollment, AP credits, CLEP tests, all of those things that you can bring in from high school or take a, you know, take a summer class at your community college, online classes to help supplement so that you can enjoy your semesters and not be too busy, but it's possible. We've seen it. We do have, we have a lot of those students taking our summer online classes at the yeah. university as well. So, um, and, and Dr. Obo, we also have um, um, hookup majors where by um, like music and communication, that would be a major music and, um, 
Bible, whereby in Bible you can get an emphasis in biblical counseling or biblical studies or youth ministries, but music and something else. And uh, I love those hookup majors because you get a little of everything. And sometimes students will say, well, I want more of a, another area. And so they would get two majors. But like Sarah says, in today's world, you can do that much more handily than you could have done 10 years ago. Yeah. Where can we hear some of the recordings uh, that the university has produced, either through choirs or uh, orchestra? Well, if you go on our website, and there are many of the albums that are available there, and uh, you can look through them, and uh, we'd love to have you purchase some of them and have them in your homes. Um, uh, we have... Um, um, some on Spotify, we have, um, uh, most of them are, we're working toward that, but most of what we have, you can get right through our own website. Mm -hmm. okay. um, in a normal year, let's step out of the current context. In a normal year, what does, uh, what does it look like for traveling for the choir at the university? Yeah, well, um, Generally, like this year, our tour was um, two weeks in what I like to call the Rocky Mountain State Tour, basically throughout Colorado and down into Texas. And uh, basically, we're in churches and schools and community centers. And um, But now next year, we are going to Israel and um, spending two weeks in Israel. And again, I, I think... Once a person experiences Israel, they um, read the Bible differently. It's often said they read it in living color now. But I, I one of the reasons we go every four years to that country, um, we have a campus over there, and I love to have our students study there. But uh, we have gone as the guests of the Ministry of Tourism for several years. And uh, sometimes we sing in completely Jewish audiences, and many times our repertoire is 30 to 40 percent Hebrew. And uh, but we sing in churches. Many times we're in some wonderful, solid churches. And um, but we do um, uh, we hook up with other choirs. We do festivals together and so forth. But um, then we we travel throughout all of the the country. We do an East Coast tour a Northwest tour, a Midwest tour, and a Rocky Mountain States tour. That's basically what they look like when they're in this country, when we're in this country. But uh, often when we go to Israel, we also spend a week in Spain or Italy. And um, we're looking at another country right now for this next year. And I'm not even gonna tell you what it is because it may not happen, but um, mm. it, it's very, very exciting. But when we do an East Coast tour, often we sing at Carnegie Hall or the Kennedy Center. And um, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity um, to um, sing some major works there. And uh, um, uh, the last time that we did it, it was a community group. I mean, of, of um, basically our existing chorale and the alums that wanted to join. So. It was, it was all a master's um, uh, alumni choir. It was wonderful. And we did um, Dan Forrest's Requiem for the Living. Great work. Wonderful. Well, um, we have a number of very specific questions, I think, that came up on the panelists. I'm going to encourage uh, those pan the, or, I'm sorry, not the panelists, but the attendees. I'm gonna encourage them uh, to connect through our admissions department on some of those specific questions uh, so that we can connect you to some of the faculty that can be specific about industry placement and these kind of things. Um, we, you know, I, I just enjoy being around Dr. Plew uh, and, and, the, and the faculty there. Sarah and I have just had a great connection. Her uh, husband teaches for our online program. And so I've gotten to know them well and um, so, just a pleasure to work uh, with you. I'm gonna turn it back over to Vanessa at this point. 
Uh, I have a couple of answer, questions I'll answer here on, on the side uh, before we finish, but uh, just looking forward to a time when we can come back together and uh, our plans and hope is that everything will be fine for us to gather again in the fall. And so we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hopewell, Dr. Fu, and Sarah. We have appreciated hearing from you. It's been informative and I hope for our guests at home that it's been helpful and also sparked a lot of interest and excitement. Um, we love our School of Music here at TMU. Mm -hmm. We would love to hear from you. So please go ahead and continue to reach out if you do have additional questions. Uh, you can, like uh, Dr. Hopewell said, reach out to our admissions department, they'll connect you. And you can also uh, take a look at our website, masters.edu. Well, stay tuned for more webinars. And if you haven't seen already, we have um, other webinars recorded uh, about different departments, different schools that we have here at the Masters University. We hope that that is helpful for you. We thank you for joining us and you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.